get started. So good afternoon and welcome everyone to the first virtual meeting of the Northern Tier Passenger Rail Study Working Group. My name is Michaela Niles. I'm the MassDOT Project Manager for this effort, and I'm joined today by members of our consultant team, who I'll introduce more formally in a bit. I would like to thank you all for joining us this afternoon and thank our working group members here in attendance, including our elected officials on the call today. So before we launch into today's presentation, I would like to start with a few procedures for today's meeting. First, please note that this public meeting is being recorded. The Massachusetts Department of Transportation may choose to retain and distribute the video, still images, audio, and or chat transcript. And by continuing attendance with this virtual meeting, you are consenting to participate in a recorded event. All recordings and chat transcripts will be considered a public record. If you are not comfortable being recorded, please turn off your camera, keep your microphone muted, and refrain from utilizing the Q&A. Working group members will have the opportunity to ask questions and share comments at points during the presentation. To participate, you may use the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen, or if you're participating by phone, please, you may dial star nine. We will then call your name so that you may share your question or comment. We ask that you please keep your microphone muted unless speaking, and we ask that all speakers begin by stating their name. And this will benefit everyone, especially those who are participating by phone today. Working group members will be able to share their video. You may keep your video on or off, but the main request is to minimize distractions for those who are viewing the presentation. Members of the public in attendance may submit comments or questions at any time in writing using the Q&A, and meeting staff will address them as time allows at the end of the presentation. And if you need technical assistance, please email Leah Epstein at lepstein at hntb.com. And at this time, we'd like to hear from all of you and learn more about how you heard about the meeting. So a polling question will appear on your screen shortly uh, and we'll keep the poll open for about 30 seconds or so to allow folks time to participate. So I'm launching the poll now. All right, and so with that, I will end the poll. And uh, just so everyone kind of can see how people have heard about the meeting, it looks like we had a great mix. Uh, a lot of people heard about the meeting through email, social media, the news, word of mouth. So uh, thank you all again for taking the time to answer the poll and we appreciate you sharing uh, your input with us. Uh, so for today's meeting, we'll be using a story map format for the presentation. And as part of today's agenda, we'll have introductions of the study team. Uh, and the working group, as well as talk about the role of the working group and provide an overview of the study process. We'll also share a preview of the study context and then have a discussion of the goals for the study. Finally, we'll outline the next steps for the study and open up the floor for public comment. Uh, next. As we kind of move to the introductions, we've assembled an incredible study team. Uh, and here today we have Anna Barry and Paul Nelson, uh, project manager and deputy project manager from HNTB. We also have with us today, Erica Blonde and Leah Epstein, Lauren Vonch, our public involvement team from HNTB, as well as David Baumgartner uh, and Andreas Appley from Cambridge Systematics, who will be working on various aspects of the study, including community and economic development. And so at this time, I would like to have each of the working group members in attendance today introduce themselves uh, the organization or institution that they're representing and share uh, the one most important outcome to be achieved from a Northern Tier service. And so with that, I will kind of go through my list of those in attendance here today. Um, let's see who we have here. Uh, Mayor Wiedegartner. Hello there, everyone. I'm Mayor Wiedegartner from the city of Greenfield, and I am 
here today to learn more about the plan for the East-West Rail and to see and make sure that Greenfield is well included in it. We're an ideal stopping point uh, from say North Adams to Greenfield and then on to Boston and points before that. Great, thank you. And thank you for being here today. Mm -hmm. uh, next, I see Ashley Stolba. Hi there, my name is Ashley Stolba and I am Undersecretary of Community Development with the Executive Office of Housing and Economic Development. And I apologize that I'm not on video. I am driving, which is not the safest thing to do right now, um, but I'm driving between some um, MassWorks announcements. Um, but my primary goal is to learn more about this project and also make sure that we're coming to a consensus driven decision. So thank you all for being a part of this. Um, and thank you for asking me to serve on this group. Great, thank you. And thank you for being here. Uh, next, I see uh, Senator Comerford's office. Hi there, Michaela. This is Joe Comerford. Um, thank you so much for your work and for the work of assembling such a great team to do this study. I represent the Hampshire Franklin Worcester District in the State Senate. I had the uh, privilege of filing the legislation um, and, and working with Rep. Lay and many colleagues uh, uh, to pass it through uh, so that we can have this study. And the most important outcome that I'd like from a Northern Tier study is uh, really robust community engagement. I heard about this rail um, and the impact of this rail, the actually extraordinarily positive impact of this rail, um, passenger rail, when I was campaigning and I'd love the community be, to be able to be brought in as you're planning to tell their story uh, so that we can all really hear what they've experienced in Franklin County and the Northern Berkshires and Northern Worcester County and really take that to heart as we go forward. So thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we next have uh, Glenn Eaton. Yes, good afternoon. Thank you. My name is Glenn Eaton. I'm the executive director with Monitors at Regional Planning Commission. We're based in uh, Lemonster. Uh, we uh, basically want to make sure that we aid all the participants in the planning process. I am curious how this study will come out compared to a similar study that was done about 25 years ago. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, we next have Jesse Samwell. Hi, I'm Jesse Samuel with the Federal Railroad Administration. Um, I'm just here today to learn more about the project and also um, to see uh, provide help in however we can. Great, thank you for joining us today. Next, we have Jody Ray. Hi, I'm Jody Ray. I'm Assistant General Manager at the MBTA for Commuter Rail and Ferry Operations. Um, but spent an awful lot of time uh, during the construction and rebuilding of the uh, Connecticut River Main Line, which will connect at Greenfield to this. Um, glad to be available to uh, serve on the committee. Great, thank you for being here, Jody. Next, we have Senator Cronin. Hi, I'm Susan Templeton, and I'm the district director for Senator John Cronin of the Worcester and Middlesex District. He is disappointed he can't be here, um, but I'm here on his behalf. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Next, we have Jonathan Butler. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Jonathan Butler. I'm the president and CEO of One Berkshire, the regional business, economic development, and marketing organization for the Berkshires. Um, in terms of outcomes that we'd love to see, anything that creates better connectivity between Eastern Mass and Western Mass through Central Mass and any of the economic benefits that potentially come with that. Great, thank you for being here. Next, we have Josh Ostroff. Thank you so much. I'm Josh Ostroff, the interim director of the Transportation for Massachusetts Coalition. We're a, a statewide advocacy uh, coalition of over 100 organizations across the state, and we want more equitable, uh, just, uh, clean, uh, efficient, modern transportation for all the benefits that it provides. So I'm um, pleased to be a part of this process, and I want to acknowledge our legislative partners for helping to uh, kickstart this. Um, so thank you so much. And the outcome I'm hoping for is a, uh, a credible a basis for uh, sustained investment in uh, capital and the operations needed to provide mobility across the state, particularly to an underserved region 
in the northern tier that uh, doesn't have uh, good regional uh, interregional connections. So I'm excited to see what we can do um, to move this all forward. Thanks so much for convening it and for being here. Thank you and welcome. Next, we have Linda Dunleavy. Thanks, Michaela. I'm Linda Dunleavy from the Franklin Regional Council of Governments in Franklin County. Um, and the outcome I hope we achieve is to show how transformational reintroduction of passenger rail on this corridor can be for all of Massachusetts and especially Western Massachusetts. Thanks. Thank you. Next, we have Congressman Neal's office. Hi uh, there, I'm Matt. I'm um, Transportation in LA for Congressman Neal. Uh, thank you for having us here today. Thank you for being here. Next, we have Representative Blay. Hi, everyone. State Representative Natalie Blay representing the 1st Franklin District, which includes 19 communities here in Western Massachusetts, spanning Franklin, Hampshire, and Hamden counties. Uh, Michaela, I just want to say thanks to you and your team uh, for pulling this uh, together today. Uh, it's, it's nice to see so many familiar faces who have worked on rail and transportation issues, uh, including you, Jody Ray. I just want to give you a, a special hello uh, from out here in Western Mass. Um, so grateful for Senator Comerford's partnership and um, as well as legislative partners uh, across the entire region. Senator Comerford mentioned in terms of outcomes, you know, community impact. And I just want to, to echo that community. Um, <laughs> participation and really looking for, for maximum output when it comes to uh, how rail can impact our, our climate goals, economic development, transportation options, and, and transportation equity. So, so thank you again, Michaela. Uh, we really appreciate this and look forward to, to this process and certainly a robust uh, community participation. Thank you and thank you for being here. Welcome. Next, we have Mayor Bernard. Good afternoon, Tom Bernard from the city of North Adams, uh, and I would just echo what we've been what we've been hearing. I mean, we know that transportation is the key to economic development. It is the key to uh, business development. It is the key to supporting tourism and cultural and outdoor outdoor recreation. And the moment and the and the time and the momentum and the and the funding as we look at what's happening in in uh, Washington is is there for us to to think very creatively and to capitalize on uh, the promise of of this effort. So I thank you all for for your work and for being part of the conversation. Thank you. Uh, next we have Peter Lowett. Yeah. Good afternoon. My name is Peter Lowett. I'm director of the Devons Enterprise Commission, and I chair the Fitchburg Line Working Group. Uh, we learned firsthand the importance of uh, organizing and keeping legislators and congressional delegation and communities up and down the Fitchburg line in the loop and active participants as we were able to achieve uh, over $272 million in investments in uh, the Fitchburg line out to, uh, out to uh, from Boston out to uh, Fitchburg. So uh, we'd love to see it go the rest of the way and just uh, advise you all to organize and uh, participate and good luck. Thank you. Next we have Robert Malnati. Hi, Michaela. Uh, Bob Malnati from the Berkshire Regional Transit Authority. Um, here to listen and hopefully be able to provide service uh, to the end product for the first last mile. Great, thank you, Bob, for being here. Next, we have Roy. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Roy Nascimento. I'm uh, president and CEO of the North Central Massachusetts Chamber of Commerce. In my, in my role as president of the chamber, I'm also president of the North Central Massachusetts Development Corporation. And uh, in terms of outcomes, um, like many of the participants today, uh, just want to see some positive uh, economic uh, impacts from, uh, from this project, uh, from the interconnectivity of the, of the region, um, 
to the western part of the state and uh, to Boston. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Tom Matusko. Yes, thanks, Michaela. I'm Tom Matusko, the executive director of the Berkshire Regional Planning Commission. And uh, I guess the most important outcome from this study is an actionable plan and program that brings consistent, affordable, reliable passenger rail service to North Adams from points east. Thank you, Tom, for being here. Next, we have Tina. Sorry, guys, problems with the phone. <laughs> Um, I'm here, I'm the administrator with the Franklin Regional Transit Authority. And again, like everyone has um, commented on, I'm just very anxious to see how this is going to um, commence with our regional transit authority and getting people back and forth to Boston, which has been a huge ask, whether people are coming into the office looking for rail service to Boston or the inner city buses, it's definitely a huge need and there is a gap. Um, that we need to fill. So I'm, I'm very anxious to hear how this is going to um, progress forward. Great, thank you. And thank you for being here. Are, is there any other working group members that I may have missed? Uh, sometimes the Zoom uh, list starts to you know change on you. So if there's anyone that I may have missed, Hearing none, I will um, move ahead in the agenda. So uh, thank you all for being here and for sharing some of your uh, important outcomes of the study with us. Um, and now kind of moving forward to kind of a little bit more about the working group. The working group has a few primary roles. So we ask that working group members share your knowledge and your expertise with the study team uh, and your fellow working group members. We also ask that members actively participate and engage at meetings while respecting the perspectives of others. The working group is also asked to review the information that is presented, have conversations with your colleagues members of your organization and provide us with your feedback on the materials. Uh, and finally, uh, public involvement, uh, which will be a critical component for this effort. And we ask that you please share the study website information with your family, friends, constituents, community members, so that they too can be involved in this process. And so kind of moving ahead now to talking about the study itself. So as a bit of background on this effort, in section 84 of the 2020 state budget, the Massachusetts legislator, legislature directed MassDOT to conduct a study of the feasibility of rail access between North Adams and Boston. And we're happy to have so many uh, who championed this effort on the call here today. And so this conceptual planning study seeks to assess the economic and environmental benefits, as well as any associated implementation challenges and identify all necessary improvements to support restored passenger rail service along the Northern tier. And so now talking about the process itself. So in terms of the process itself, uh, we'll pull up a chart uh, in a bit that kind of speaks to and outlines the study process. And so each of the steps here and builds upon the previous one. And for those of you who attended or viewed the recording of the community event that was held over the summer, this graphic may be familiar. So in the study process, public participation serves as the foundation of the study and will be carried throughout. This team now is beginning to collect data and document previous efforts and operations along the corridor. We will then conduct a market analysis, looking at things like demographics, land use, and the current and future travel patterns. Next, we'll start identifying the right of way, ownership and regulatory requirements and any related opportunities or constraints. Then with that information in mind and based on the feedback received, up to six service alternatives will be developed and evaluated. And that evaluation process will look at elements like estimated capital and operations and maintenance costs, estimated economic, environmental, and community benefits or impacts, and estimated ridership. And finally, recommendations will be developed. And all of that information will be documented in a draft report, which will be released for public review and comment, and then finalized in a final report. And this study is expected to take up to 16 months. 
And so this, the working group will meet based on the deliverables at these study milestones and public information meetings will also be held to receive input and feedback with the first public information meeting to be held in the spring. And so please note that all working group meetings are open to the public and there are certainly ways to participate in addition to the working group forum. And so at this time, I will turn it over to Paul to talk more about the alternatives development and analysis process and those additional opportunities for public involvement. Paul? Thanks, Michaela. Uh, it's not so nice to meet everybody. Um, as as Michaela mentioned, my name is Paul Nelson, and I'm the deputy project manager for the consultant team on the project. And all I really wanted to present here as far as our alternatives development and analysis process is the fact that um, we have six service alternatives that we're scoped to look at. But instead of uh, what we're proposing to do is instead of looking at all six at once and uh, developing all six and then evaluating all six all at the same time, we'd actually like to do it in two phases. Um, and in that first phase, we proposed to, and we're planning to do to look at two alternatives. The first one we're calling a minimum build and the second one uh, being called the maximum build. Uh, and for by minimum build, uh, we, we mean looking at the level of passenger service uh, speeds and stations possible under the existing rail conditions, the existing physical conditions, ownership conditions and operational conditions. Uh, but for the and for the maximum build, we look at something uh, I think more towards the the full full investment. So something the something where we can provide the best level of passenger rail service through major investments in the rail infrastructure and start to seek travel times that are competitive with auto travel. Um, and what we really hope by uh, and then once those two alternatives are developed. Um, we would actually bring them through the full evaluation process, looking at the different criteria, and then pause that process and bring it back to the public so that everybody has a chance to see, um, kind of almost calling it what the bookends of different services um, may be, so that we can have uh, an in-depth interactive discussion with the public stakeholders, with the working group, to understand you know, what your reactions are, where your questions are on how these, these two initial uh, scenarios went through the process. And so we're planning to do that not only through the meetings, but, um, but a public workshop where we take um, some more time to go through some of the more um, technical elements of it, say like cost estimates or ridership prediction, uh, and then use that feedback to develop the four remaining scenarios uh, so that we can start to fine tune it closer to something that uh, matches that implementable goal to bring, uh, potentially bring service and, and the benefits to the communities in the corridor. Thank you. Uh, and as I mentioned, you know, beyond the working group, there will be uh, a, a many additional engagement opportunities. You know, working group members, we're hoping, like Michaela said, that you can serve as a, as a community resource for people who have questions. We know there's a lot of interest in, in the project and the potential benefits. Uh, we'll, we'll hold the public workshops. We're planning to have an interactive website uh, that'll allow people to, to be a resource for people who are interested in learning about the study and some of the things that we're looking at. And then also the, the project study website will have a comment and subscription form. And I think Michaela, I'm turning it back to you. Yes. Thanks, Paul. Sure thing. So at this time, we wanted to kind of preview a bit of the study context. And the first thing to highlight is the corridor itself, which, as I mentioned earlier, spans North Adams to Boston. And the MBTA currently operates the Fitchburg line between Boston North Station and Wachusett in Fitchburg. And then west of Wachusett sees freight rail operations. And so as part of the data collection effort, our team will look more closely at the right of way and the physical aspects of the corridor, like the curvature, the grades, or the steepness, uh, and any restrictions or considerations pertaining to the corridor. The next kind of similarity or next kind of thing we wanted to highlight in terms of the, of the study context are the similarities to the East-West Passenger Rail Study. And so that effort focused on alternatives that could provide increased connectivity and enhanced mobility between Pittsfield, Springfield, Worcester, and Boston. And the final report for that effort was released earlier this year. And in alignment with the recommendations that were outlined in that final report, MassDOT released a uh, white paper on uh, Massachusetts intercity passenger rail governance, which I would encourage folks to, to view if you have not already, and that paper is available on the East-West Study website. 
And then so in terms of some of the lessons learned from that process, the East-West process really highlighted the importance of increased transportation options, as well as the investments that may be required. And so another element uh, of the study context relates to Pan Am as well. And so I'll turn it over here to Anna to talk more about that. Well, good afternoon, nice to uh, meet you all here today. As uh, most of you know, I'm sure the Pan Am Railways is one of New England's regional railroads. Uh, and one of its uh, key importance, uh, important issues for us here today is that it's a 50% owner of an, a, a company called Pan Am Southern. So Pan Am Railways and Pan Am Southern own um, together 50% shares of uh, this Pan Am Southern entity, which owns and operates the rail freight railroad between Fitchburg and the state line with New York. So clearly uh, it has a, a, an interest in, in this project and we have an interest in it. Uh, the uh, transaction we're interested in most is that CSX Transportation, one of the nation's largest freight railroads, has petitioned the Surface Transportation Board to acquire Pan Am Railways. And therefore that 50% share in Pan Am Southern, uh, which we would like to call the Northern Tier right of way. So the, it's currently before the Surface Transportation Board in Washington. Uh, Briefings, I believe, are due at the beginning of the year. The board announced last week that they would be holding a public hearing, which is open to all. It's a virtual public hearing. Uh, the deadline to file for that is next week. The hearing will be held on January 13th and extended into the 14th if they have a high level of interest. The current schedule right now involves issuing a decision by the middle of a uh, April and that the decision would be effective in the middle of May. So clearly we have some shifting uh, circumstances surrounding the Northern Tier right of way that we'll keep an eye on, but essentially it's, it's uh, the study can proceed effectively while that is going on. Great, thank you, Anna. So at this time, we wanna open up to talk about the goals for the study. And so a goal itself is a statement of purpose that represents the desired outcome. And with those goals in mind, objectives are developed. Uh, which are particular actions meant to achieve a goal. So one example, as we kind of click through our slides, is uh, could be to improve the attractiveness of the Northern Tier as an affordable place to live. And some of the associated objectives could be for stations to be located where there's an existing supply of affordable housing, or to provide service that would be convenient for work schedules at existing employment centers. And something to keep in mind for a goal like this would be how it compares to uh, potential, uh, potential objectives for attracting new businesses. Another example goal may be to improve mobility for populations who are dependent upon transit. Uh, some of the associated objectives could be to have connections to existing uh, RTA bus routes, or to provide service to serve non-work related trips. So the study has a, uh, a proposed set of goals related to affordability, economic development, mobility, reducing the number of automobile trips and reducing greenhouse gas and, and air quality impacts. And so we have a quick poll that we wanna share with you all uh, that asks you to please select your top three priorities out of the potential goals listed. And also let us know if there are any that are missing. So I'm launching that poll right now and we'll keep that open for uh, about 30 seconds or so for people to participate. All right, we'll give folks a couple more seconds to complete the poll. All right, I will end the poll now and share the results. Um, so we're seeing a kind of even balance between some of the the, the, 
the potential goals that were listed um, in terms of affordability, uh, economic development, mobility, uh, in, uh, environmental uh, impacts as well. And it looks like uh, there are also some goals that may be missing. So we look forward to hearing from all of you in terms of kind of your thoughts on some things that could be added or changed to this list. And so at this point, I wanna open it up to the working group members. So if anyone has any thoughts on the goals that have been uh, kind of developed at this point, or have any goals of your own that you'd like to share, uh, please raise your virtual hand and you're welcome to unmute. Uh, Mayor Bernard. Uh, thanks, Michaela. I think that the one thing I would I would say is um, we actually have in this list of, of five goals some some really wonderfully complementary uh, ideas that are broken out here, and I think with some with some thought and um, revision of language, we we can accomplish we can accomplish all these things because the project will, but economic development, competitiveness, attractiveness, they all feed each other. They're all, they're all related. And then uh, the, the last two really get to, to climate resiliency. So if, if, there's a, if there's a way to reframe, I think we can really get a set of goals that touches all of these, all of these points in a very, a very concrete and, and action-focused way. Thank you. We next have a raised hand from Linda. Great minds, Mayor. I was going to say the same thing, that if um, if the goal is to only have three goals, Michaela, I think there would be a way to combine these into three very strong goals that would be supported by um, everyone here. Happy to help with that. Great, thank you. And if anyone has any kind of ideas on some of the proposed language that you'd like to see, please feel free to share that as part of this discussion as well. Um, so we next have a raised hand from Josh. Thank you so much. Um, and fully agree with uh, the previous two um, uh, panel members, but I'm interested in knowing what kinds of um, programs would best align with uh, future federal funding streams that may be downstream a little bit. But, uh, but I think it's something that we want to keep in mind as we evaluate alternatives and start looking at costs. You know, how could this be uh, affordably funded and you know, what options will be available to us? Assuming that's considered to be within our scope. Thank you. Yes, we will, as part of this process, be looking at some uh, funding opportunities as well. And, you know, I think as we all on this call are aware that, you know, the recent infrastructure bill has has monies attached to it that, uh, and, you know, I think we're all kind of excited about the potential uh, in terms of transportation options and what that can lead to. Um, Mayor Bernard, I see a hand raised. Uh, sorry, Michaela, I just never lowered it. I apologize. Oh, no problem. Are there any other members of the working group who have any comments on some of the goals or have any goals of your own? Actually, if I could just uh, weigh in here, Michaela, uh, I think that the transportation connections uh, will certainly be something that we need to be looking at, not only here within Massachusetts, uh, but also interstate connections and also with other modes of, of transportation, including our RTAs and public forms of transportation. Thank you. Yes, we'll certainly take into account those, those connections that can be made. Josh? Yeah, so um, I'm also super interested to know whether we will be able to uh, achieve the travel time of about two hours and 15 minutes from Greenfield to Boston that was the Boston and Maine provided in 1952. There's my benchmark. Great, thank you. Any other comments or questions or things to add from the working group? Is there anything that's missing? Linda? Sorry, Michaela. Can, can I go back to um, ask a question of Paul? 
Is it too late to do that? Please go ahead. Um, Paul, can you re-explain what you said about minimum and maximum when you were talking about the alternatives analysis? Yeah, thank you for your question. Um, what, what really the idea is that um, you have a system, um, I guess I'll just explain like how we came to that as a proposed approach. And the idea is that you have an existing system west of Wachusett that doesn't serve passenger rail right now, and it only serves freight. Uh, and the idea being that that rail is in a condition that would only allow passenger rail to travel at a certain speed um, and has certain conflicts with freight under whatever the um, expected level of traffic is. And so we were thinking that um, because the benefit versus the cost is kind of always the trade off there, that we need to see kind of what the what we would kind of be getting into if we just tried to run that passenger service in the existing condition of the rail. I mean, with some moderate improvement, improvements to make sure it's safe and to make sure it's reliable. Um, but we wanted to kind of define that base level of service that would be provided, almost to kind of understand like how much of an effort we have in front of us to try and get to those to the service that I think is really desired by the legislative intent and by this group. Uh, and so then once we have that understanding of kind of the minimum service that would be able to be provided, then we would actually take a look at the physical infrastructure and try and identify ways to increase speed uh, on the line. And that would be looking at curves that are especially tight and maybe ways to straighten them out. Uh, could we look at uh, other elements of the rail? But the idea being that we wanna know um, first thing, how successful um, that large investment in the rail would be in, in growing and driving ridership. And so those would be, so what we were basically thinking is that that would help define the, the almost kind of like the best and worst case scenarios for what this, all, this passenger service could look like. And then what we could do is we could take elements of each of those after we get feedback from the community uh, and develop kind of um, other alternatives that we could test that would help us get close to the service that we think is implementable and satisfies uh, the the metrics that we're looking at as far as how well it operates. Does that help clarify things? Yeah. So I would think. So I'm hearing the minimum is kind of like a no build alternative, no improvements, and then you would ratchet up to reach Josh's goal of whatever he said, two hours and fifty eight minutes. Is that and that might be max or max could he be even faster yes right. that's, that's definitely the idea okay thanks so much thank you next have a raised hand from senator comerford thanks michaela um this is all really helpful i want to i want to just uh second what folks have said that with some you know wordsmithing i think we can figure out a way that these are very synergistically aligned um intense and i think we can develop uh, a great regional economic development housing goal and a great climate resilience goal um, and have them be sisters in this. I had a question about, actually this ties into what Josh and Paul and Linda were just saying. So, um, so as Paul's thinking about these two, um, two different models, they themselves would each have to serve the goals. So for example, um, if we have this minimum viable product model, that model would still have to serve a regional economic development purpose for say, for example, a city like Greenfield or any of the points along the rail. Um, and same, the climate goal, we'd, it would have to serve it. So even at the minimum, we, we would as a team be looking to serve the goals. And then there's the sort of Mercedes-Benz goal of you know, perhaps even more turbocharged economy, quicker service, more jobs, more housing, um, but that there would be this, uh, the goals would be served by the minimum and the maximum. Yes. Yes, thank you. I see you nodding. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments um, from the working group on the goals? Are there any things that are missing? or any kind of language that you'd particularly like to see? Mayor Wiedegartner? It's the mute button. Getting back to what Paul said about the, uh, and explained very well about the minimum and the maximum, I, I really appreciate that. 
Uh, thanks for asking the question, Linda. Uh, is there, is it an either or, or I, I perhaps I missed it when you spoke, but it, is it an either or, or is it a, a, a plan to transition from minimum to somewhere near maximum? Uh, I noticed the two hour and 15 minute um, trip time, um, which is fine. I think it would be better if it were under two, which seems to me like you would be moving closer to the uh, maximum if if you need a little bit higher speeds. But, um, so I'm curious if there is, if, if there's any plan now, or if, that, if, uh, if that's what we are, part of the work that we're doing to see if it's one or the other or some version of a transition. Paul, do you want to kind of speak to that process? Trevor Kill, I'm willing to give it a shot if you let me know if I've missed anything anywhere. <laughs> um, so the I think the idea would be that all of the, so we still, once we develop those first two, we then still have four service alternatives that we can develop to test mm -hmm. maybe interim steps because um, the ultimate goal is an implementation plan. Um, and that plan can have multiple steps, like you're saying. So I don't think it's necessarily an either or, or. I think we just wanna, we wanna test the maximum benefit. So, you know, what would, the, what would the sub two hour travel times, if it's possible, get us in benefits to the communities in mm -hmm. ridership and things like that. Mm -hmm. But then also it might be nice to, it, look at other options in between the minimum and the maximum build so that when you're applying for the first section of projects, you know what the benefits are and can quantify them for applications and things like that. So um, I, I, there's definitely a way that we could look at the following four service plans as testing interim steps between the minimum and maximum. Does that sound okay, Michaela? That sounds great. Thank okay. you, Paul. Sure thing. Any other comments on the goals of the working group? Yes, I see a raised hand. Go ahead. Is the raised hand me by any chance? That is you. <laughs> All right. I didn't hear any name, but I didn't see any picture either later earlier. But uh, uh, this is Representative Barrett from uh, North Adams. I, I think what has to be understand, understood in undertaking this study is that it is so important. And I go back with this project nearly 50 years um, from when I saw the last uh, passenger train leave Williamstown, Massachusetts, I believe, in 1958 as a, a young boy of my father. And then following it up uh, uh, with Governor Dukakis in 1984, when I became mayor of the city of North Adams and how important travel was, especially passenger uh, access to the Northern Berkshire area and of course onto New York and Vermont. And I think that's one of the key elements of this study as far as I'm concerned. I know every, others have the other concerns and I, and I don't disagree with them, but unless we get good passenger service and I'm not talking about high speed, uh, into the area. It was promoted by Governor Dukakis back in 1984-85. He was very interested in it. But that and broadband is what's going to open up not only Northern Berkshire area, but also Franklin County uh, in, in that entire area through that, right on into Fitchburg. It's essential if we're to grow our area. We're one of the uh, few counties in, in Massachusetts that uh, has been losing population. It's even worse in the Northern Berkshire area. And the only thing that's gonna solve our problem is decent passenger service because it's gonna open up a lot of avenues for us. It's gonna help Fitchburg. It's gonna help that Lemonster, that entire area through there. Uh, and it's an economic development uh, essential for our area um, in so many ways as we have seen what COVID has done in changing our lifestyles and how we work and things like that. Um, it is about economic development more than anything else. And I hope that uh, we key in on that area. And also um, that we try not to waste 18 months and that we possibly reduce um, uh, this, this study in, in less time and get it done and give it the attention that it should be. Uh, we're the only state in the union that takes uh, so long to uh, uh, do some of these studies. Uh, the time for studies uh, uh, is, is ridiculous and we have to reduce it. 
this is critical. And I can't stress that enough. Um, it's great with the high speed uh, east west service that they're talking about, but this is an easy solution that can be there in the interim. And it is also making sure that CSX and, uh, and, and Pan Am are on the same page. So from that end of it, it's about economic development. And I would like to see this uh, uh, go that way. The rest of it is just common sense. Is it gonna reduce carbon emissions with cars and everything else? Of course it is. Those are the things that are gonna happen but we have to look at other things in the positive side of it. So that's where I'm coming from, so. Thank you for your comments, Representative Barrett. We appreciate you being here and for sharing. Are there any other comments on the goals from members of the working group? Feel free to raise your virtual hand if I'm missing you. Seeing none, um, we will continue. Thank you all for the discussion and for sharing some of your, your goals and your thoughts on the process and, and what this study can be. Um, we appreciate your input and we hope to receive input from others in attendance as well as we move to the, uh, the public comment portion of the, the, the presentation. And so uh, as Part of the next steps, uh, the team will develop objectives for each of the goals. We'll refine those goals based on what we've heard here today, and we'll share them with you for review and comment. And so, as I mentioned a bit earlier, the study team is beginning to document previous efforts along the corridor, and will continue to advance those study tasks. And we expect this study to be completed in the spring of 2023. And so, in terms of schedule, uh, we anticipate holding the next working group meeting in the spring to share information and receive feedback on the existing condition data uh, collection effort, as well as the goals uh, and objectives that uh, have been developed based on our conversation here today. And so with that, before we open up the floor, are there any closing questions or comments from the working group? Representative Flay. Thanks, thanks, Mikhail. I appreciate it. I, I was just wondering if you could talk with us a little bit more about how the the members of the working group were determined. Um, that would be helpful for us all to understand, and uh, and how we will be really really getting a broad variety of, of stakeholders uh, into this process. Thank you for the question. Yes. So the working group is comprised of federal and state elected officials, uh, regional, local representatives from across the corridor. Um, we also have economic development uh, representatives. Uh, we also have folks from our rail industry that we've invited to participate as well. And as you mentioned, kind of had that broad uh, expertise and knowledge base uh, that spans the corridor. Um, and so that's kind of what uh, made up the, the working group is getting those different perspectives uh, from everyone from across the corridor. I appreciate that. If we, if we notice any gaps that we, we think could be filled, uh, are you open to exploring that and adding some additional members to the working group? Yes, we're yes. certainly okay. open to adding additional members as well. Um, but also everyone is, these meetings are open to everyone. Everyone is welcome to attend working group meetings and public meetings. And we look forward to hearing from everyone and working with everyone through this process. Thanks, Michaela. Of course, thank you. Uh, Senator Comerford. Thanks, Michaela. That was helpful. Thanks, Replay, for asking that question. And thank you, Michaela, for your answer. Um, I wonder if we could level set as a working group around expectations. Um, and if you could give us a sense of how the relationship will go with uh, MassDOT and the consultant, um, how many meetings we should expect, when we'll get the materials for the meeting, um, you know, the, the depth of engagement that you're looking for, whether or not we should communicate with you. And I would think yes, but uh, between meetings, um, whether or not we will see draft agendas to help comment on them, that kind of thing. If we could just get a, a visibility into your picture currently on how you'll best work with the working group. 
course. So I'll start and then I'll probably have Paul or Erica talk a little bit more about the public engagement strategy that we have and sort of kind of the, the schedule of meetings that are anticipated to be held. Um, so the first kind of piece of it is it's a tiered approach. So we have these working group meetings that are all open to the public. We will have public involvement meetings, public information meetings as well. We'll also have stakeholder engagement uh, opportunities as well. So, you know, we're hoping at some point during this process, we'll be able to meet in person, um, but we are kind of being cognizant of the changing landscape as it as it comes to COVID. Um, so we're, we're virtual for now, and hopefully we'll shift to a kind of more hybrid approach going forward. And then we'll also have uh, an online engagement stakeholder uh, system as well, where we have our, uh, our study website, that some people have you know, kind of engaged with already, we'll be adding materials there where people who may not be able to attend meetings can kind of engage that way as well. Um, so we will have, in terms of kind of information sharing as well, this is a, a great forum to do so, but it's not the only forum. Please feel free to always email me or you know, if you have any comments or questions kind of in the, the intermediate phases. Um, and we also have, like I mentioned, the comment form as well, um, in terms of kind of setting up the, the agendas for each meeting, they'll all kind of sort of, they'll all align with the study tasks. So as I mentioned a little bit earlier, in terms of how we see kind of the agenda for the next meeting, we'll be planning to share information and receive feedback on the existing conditions data collection effort. And then also kind of recap this meeting as well and come back to you all to talk about some of the goals that have been developed if and the objectives as well and if there are any uh, comments, questions or, or changes that people have. So now I'd kind of move to Erica or Paul, is, are there any things that you'd like to add about kind of the stakeholder engagement process? Sure. Uh, thanks, Michaela, and thanks for the question. I think part of the question was about receiving materials in advance um, and kind of notifications in advance. And so um, we do strive to kind of notify at least two weeks in advance. And if there are materials that um, we're going to ask, you know, that you review um, as part of the working group, then we'll also um, make sure that you have ample time to review those in advance. And as Michaela noted, um, we'll have uh, materials like the story map that has been shown today available on the project website, um, along with a common form that's accessible 24-7 um, to everyone, um, where they can get responses directly from the program team. So, um, and as Michaela said, if there's questions sort of outside of that, um, need kind of more one-on-one -on -one engagement, um, feel free to reach out to Michaela um, or to any of us, and we can certainly put contact information in the in the chat. Um, I, thank you so much. Let me just just, just jump in. Um, you know, feel free to get as in the weeds as you want. So for example, you know, if we're going to set a meeting for the spring, um, mm -hmm. is it possible to either A, set the meeting super far out um, so that people, we know that the calendars will align or, or will we do doodle polls? I, I did hear from some folks, you know, that they wanted to be here, but they couldn't because it was just a, a set meeting um, with no engagement about whether or not it worked for folks. Um, so I just, I'm, 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 and we don't have to have all of these answers now, but I, I do think out, you know, in the Western region, you know, we're ready to engage, we're ready to participate super robustly. Um, and I'm just thinking through all these different things, like getting it on the calendar, getting materials out in advance, you know, really encourage, encouraging folks robust review and, and being prepared to comment on this, having all of us listen in our communities so that we can come being prepared to offer feedback about things we might not have thought about, sort of setting all those expectations and levels as we go into this so that you get the very best from, from us um, that we have to give. And I think there's, there's a lot of good to give out here uh, in terms of being great study partners. Great, thank you. Yes, we'll certainly um, adjust and you know we aim to be agile with our public involvement. So thank you for your comments, we appreciate that. Tom Matusko? Yeah, I think my comment uh, uh, mirrors the uh, Senator's comment in terms of <clears throat> making sure that we have the information well in advance. And also, I think it's important once we finish up a meeting that the material get posted uh, relatively soon after the meeting. I think that that helps with the, you know, exchange of information 
and and the uh, you know the the good information that come out of it. So just you know getting enough material time in advance to get the material so that we can actually consider it, and um, looking at what happened at a meeting would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And I, I think something we can, uh, you know, we'll consider different ways to do that. But um, yeah, we do try to turn around the minutes and post them on the website quickly. But perhaps we can even consider a notification to the working group as well, just to let you know once they're um, available so that you don't have to check. Um, so we'll, we'll think about ways to be as proactive as we can. Thank you. Any final comments from the or questions from the working group before we move to public comment. Peter? I just saw one of the questions in the uh, Q&A that I was very curious about, and that what's the level of interaction that we've had with CSX at this point? Uh, and can we uh, use their acquisition process as leverage to secure any of our goals, <laughs> nascent as they may be? So two kind of pieces to that. So CSX has been invited to participate in this process. Um, and so we are cognizant, of course, uh, as Anna mentioned, the kind of pending sale process. Um, and so while these processes are happening simultaneously, they are separate processes. So as Anna mentioned, there's a public hearing coming up in the new year to kind of share uh, public comments on that particular process. And we will be monitoring that uh, as it goes forward. Um, but yes, we have invited them to participate. We hope to, to continue conversations with our rail partners and through this process, as we continue to you know, develop the goals, develop the alternatives, communicate with them about what those needs and, and wants are. Michaela, can I add something to that? Yes, of course. Um, the, the governance paper that you mentioned that's now on the East-West Rail Study uh, website is fairly informative about the, the flexibility and leverage that you have with a private railroad company. So it's uh, it would be uh, very interesting, I think, if, you, if you're interested in this issue to take a look at it. Yes, thank you, Anna. Any other questions or comments from the working group members? All right, so with that, we will turn to the Q&A. Um, so we will now open it up to members of the public here in attendance. If you'd like to submit a comment or question in writing, please use the please continue to use the Q&A. Um, and if you would like to share a comment or question verbally, please use the raise hand button. Um, or if you're participating by phone this afternoon, please dial star nine. We ask that you please share only one comment or question at a time and limit comments to two minutes to allow others time to participate. Uh, we'd like to hear from as many people uh, about your thoughts on the goals for this study. We'd like to hear as, from as many people as we can ahead of the meetings end at three o'clock. And so as a reminder, this is not the only uh, opportunity to comment. Comments or questions can also be shared throughout the study process using the comment form that is on our study website. And so at this time, I will turn it over to Erica. Thanks, Michaela. And thank you everyone for all the great questions so far. So we'll go ahead and get started with a few questions from Deborah Yaffe. Um, she says, I am very concerned about increased diesel fumes and air pollution and also increased noise pollution in my town of Shelburne Falls. There are a lot of home businesses, uh, many healers needing quiet that are near the crossings where the horns are required to blast. Is there consideration to route the train through another part of town as they did with freight when the Hussack tunnel was being repaired? I am also very concerned about how it will affect our real estate taxes here in Buckland and Shelburne and where the stop points will be. Also concerned about the speed of trains coming through. Um, Anna, would you like to take this question? Sure, thanks, Erica. Uh, the, this is a planning study at its earliest stages, and our purpose is to begin the process of evaluating all those types of factors, environmental, economic, 
development, economic impacts, positive and negative. And our purpose is to look at various alternatives and how they generate those impacts, both positive and negative. So many of the things that you mentioned will be uh, evaluated at, at a planning level during the next year and a half, 18 months, to determine what the suitable alternatives are to minimize negative impacts and optimize the positive ones. Thank you, Anna, and um, thank you for the question, Deborah. And next, we'll go over to uh, one of the raised hands I see from Bob Armstrong. So, Bob, I'm going to unmute you, and you should be able to uh, talk. Hi, am I on? You are on. Great, thank you. Uh, well, I, I, I'm thrilled with the working group. Uh, I, anytime I'm represented by Linda Dunlevy and Natalie and Joe, we're in good hands out here in Western Mass. Thank you. Um, uh, when talking about the, the, uh, the goals of the study, what I really hope is that you view climate change mitigation as by far the number one goal of the study. And so decisions about, it, uh, about a new train system should be made towards making sure those trains run off renewable electricity and not diesel. Uh, 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 and that when we look at the other, the other goals that you have, that that they that the other goals such as uh, attracting uh, uh, economic development or affordable housing would be follow-ons of climate change mitigation and not the other way around. Um, I would encourage all you on the study to watch the movie "Don't Look Up" and try to think about who you are in that movie. Um, and that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. So next, we're going to go over to a couple questions on electrification. And so questions come from a couple of different folks. Um, but the, the crux of it is, would trains run on diesel? And is electrification of the line a possibility? Um, Anna, would you also like to speak to that? Sure, I'll, I'll try it. If anyone else can add to it, feel free. Uh, again, we're going to be looking at a variety of alternatives that deliver uh, travel times uh, in a continuum. Uh, we mentioned the minimum build and the maximum build. The maximum build would be uh, to achieve competitive travel times with the automobile or with the Boston to Maine back in 1952. So in evaluating these alternatives, um, we might look at if it might be that we determine there's a series of improvements we can take over time, as Paul mentioned earlier. And it might be if we determine that the optimum uh, optimized goal is worth working toward, we might start out with a minimum goal and, and, and a series of steps that get us to the optimized service uh, with electrified service or with another generation of, um, of locomotives that are diesel free. So I think a lot will depend on, we, we look at the alternatives, the benefits that will be generated and the, the community and the working group and others will start to determine what they want the, uh, the service to look like how quickly they want to get there, what they can afford, and, and the various stages we might go through to get there, possibly with the end point being that electrified service. Great. Thank you, Anna, and thank you for those questions. So we'll next go to another raise hand uh, from Megan Randall, and I will allow talk, and you should be um, able to unmute. Yes, thank you. My name is Megan Randall, and I live in North Pownall, so I am on the Pownall Planning Commission. If you look at your uh, study corridor map, you will see right where it ends, there's a little tiny corner of Vermont, and uh, that's where we are. <laughs> and we would like, some people here would like to see, um, can, can you hear me? We can hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, some people here would like to see passenger rail service go from North Adams, continue on from North Adams into um, Al Albany. And we would, uh, we in Pownall would like to be part of that. And I, I'm just asking what we can do to um, show our interest in, uh, and I, I think it's really important to, not only have interconnectivity in the 
Berkshire area and in the Western Mass area, but also to have interconnectivity between states. And I would really like to know what we can do on our part to um, encourage all this. Thank you. Thank you for your question, Megan. Paul or Anna, did you wanna jump in with anything? Sure, um, definitely being part of the, uh, you know, giving input to this group and to this study would be really important. So we'll get your point of view. I will say uh, in my past experience, I was part of an interstate uh, service development with, between Massachusetts and the state of Connecticut. And uh, we needed, to, we worked together as officials to achieve that. So your local regional and state officials would want to be working with the officials of MassDOT with Michaela and uh, the folks at MassDOT to uh, put that type of service uh, on the, uh, in the agenda. But at the same time, we, we do have consideration in our, in our charge for possibly considering service into New York down to the Albany area. And that will be part of the what we look at here. But uh, your interest in the study, you're expressing your interest, but also your local officials uh, being in, connected to MassDOT is one way to make sure that you're starting to make those connections that might make this feasible. And Michaela, I probably should have let you say that, but uh, it's, uh, it's what I lived through before. <laughs> No, oh, well said, Anna. And I think it also uh, that also kind of applies to some of the other comments that we received um, about other potential areas that could be looked at as well. And uh, one of them it being Williamstown as well. So what Anna says is certainly relates to that as well. Um, please continue to show up to these meetings. Uh, let your friends, colleagues know, uh, and and let us know what where you would like to see some of these stops and, and they'll be considered as part of this process. Great, thank you guys, thanks for the question. Um, we did get one question just about the URL to the East-West study. So I'm gonna go ahead and put that in the chat. Um, so uh, for everyone's reference. And then our next question will come from JV Mack. So this question says, I think it's really important to have a goal that the system meets the needs of more than the towns or downtown village areas adjacent to the rail line. This would imply that the line would be convenient to and support a larger population and that the study would need to think about multimodal connectivity to the rail line. The rail line will only be as effective and have as much support as the people who have access to the line. Multimodal connectivity is also important for people visiting towns along the line. Once they are dropped off, can they get to their destinations? Um, this sounds like maybe it's a question for Paul. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um... You know, I think that's definitely going to factor into not only how we put the alternatives together and, and identify the station locations, uh, but also how we estimate ridership, uh, because we'll be we'll be looking at, um, I guess, I guess, simple answers that we'll be looking at potential station locations all throughout the corridor. And as part of that, we'll be um, looking for connections that allow people other, you know, we want obviously good access locally to the station, but there will be some benefits to providing some stations where there's regional access to it as well. Uh, because we know that the more people who view it as a convenient option, the, the more likely they are to ride and the, the more benefits there are to the service. So, so that's a, definitely a great comment. Yeah, thank you, JB, for the comment and uh, all for the response. So next we'll go to Emily Johnson, a raised hand, and you should be good to uh, mute. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes. Great, thank you. Um, thank you all for your time and effort with the study. It sounds uh, really important. And the working group seems to have a really great representation from public officials and you know, some economic development organizations as well. Um, Rep Blaze uh, clarified that the working group can be expanded. And I'm wondering um, what extent and have Native American tribes been contacted to uh, be part of this conversation and um, Will that occur early enough so that their interest can be incorporated fully in the planning process? Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question, Michaela. Did you want to speak to that at all? Yeah, of course. So 
this is our first kind of virtual meeting uh, of this study. So our outreach is just beginning and we're at the early stages. So if you have uh, particular contacts that you think should be uh, that we should reach out to, please feel free to let us know either uh, by emailing me or through the, the comment form on our study, study website. Uh, we're happy to talk to everyone and anyone um, and be able to engage them as part of this process. Thanks, Emily, and thanks, Michaela, for the, for the answer. Um, so our next question um, is from Anne McKinnon, and um, seems like we may need a little clarification on sort of the overall goals of the study. So whether that's to establish if rail is the best mobility option or to develop a plan to implement rail service. Um, so I think I can turn that uh, over maybe to, maybe to Paul again. Yep, just give me a second to unmute. There we go. Um, yeah, thanks, Anne, for the question. So I think I think both questions are actually relevant to the, the process itself. Um, the idea um, and focus of the study is to look at the feasibility. Uh, like we're we're ultimately guided by the the legislative uh, language that was passed, and that was focused at looking at the feasibility of rail service. Um, and so what we're thinking is that the um, as we evaluate those first two maximum and minimum build scenarios. We'll start to be able to have a conversation about how those um, compare to the goals the group has, um, and you know how how we could look at options to best meet those. Now that we've looked at those two alternatives, so um, there is a feasibility question throughout the process, and then the idea is once we find a solution that um, has the consensus. Uh, then we will develop that implementation plan on how to achieve it. So I think I think both things are important to the process. Okay, thank you for the question and thanks, Paul. So our next question will come from Andy um, Hojlin. Um, sorry if I'm mispronouncing, and should be able to unmute. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, you know, thanks for doing this. Really appreciate the study being underway. Three very quick things. One is to, I guess, repeat the idea of, of going across state borders. When we met in the summer, um, there were several people from Southern Vermont and Southern New Hampshire who were interested in this. So I want to make sure that the outreach included uh, going that direction. I'm glad my neighbor and panel is on the line, but there are, there are more all across the border. Um, second thing is just to confirm that when you talk about economic development, that includes, you know, recreation, cultural institutions, especially the further out west you go. You've got, you know, kayaking, rafting, ski areas, Mass Mocha, Clark Art Institute, a lot of uh, businesses, which I think I wanted to make sure got pulled in. I'm sure they will be. And the other is um, consistency with East-West Rail. Um, there had been a controversy with East-West Rail over the size of the draw for passengers and it got expanded with a lot of advocacy. I just want to make sure that the the passenger drawing area for the northern tier is not any smaller than that so that we can grab apples to apples on the two lines. Thank you for your time. Great. Thank you, Andy, for your comment. Um, so our next comment comes from uh, Mary Westervelt, and she says, I don't see rail transportation reducing auto use unless times for travel are comparable. Cost to riders will also be a factor. Thank you, that's a, a good comment. Um, so the next person that we have, um, Alex Streisky, um, I'm going to unmute. And you should be all set. Hi, thanks. Um, I guess my question is a sort of a follow up to that last one and also the one earlier about sort of viability of this as a commuting option, but I'm totally in support of the study. I would love to ride the train to Boston. I have to go there a couple of days a week. I try going from Wachusett, driving to Wachusett, and it's a grueling commute. Um, but I hope um, I hope this, you know, there's a solution here. Um, but I guess my real point is that in an odd way, um, you know, I, I think it's important not to, in order to get the public really interested in paying attention to this, 
Um, in an odd way, I think it's important not to almost all oversell it so that no one believes that uh, the project will ever happen or that I could actually deliver on some reasonable commute time to Boston. So um, I don't mean to be skept skeptical. I'm totally in favor of this, but I also think it's really important for to get a lot of buy-in of uh, res from residents out in Western Mass. So good luck to everyone. Thanks for participating in these meetings and I'm trying to figure this out. Thank you, Alex, and thank you for being here. So our next question uh, or comment comes from James Starkey, um, who says, I live in northern West uh, Worcester County on the Route 2 corridor. This area is a huge bedroom community for people working east of here that have been priced out of the housing market there. Traffic on Route 2 is awful starting at 5 a.m. and right through the day. Rail service is badly needed, and I am certain it will be used. It's way past time to do this. There was a rail service to Gardner back over 20 years ago and it went away. It was needed then and now it's crucial. Thank you for, for your comment and for being here. So I think next we have a hand raised from Clint Richmond and you are unmuted. Uh, thank you. I'm Clint Richmond uh, representing the Massachusetts Sierra Club. Uh, on a personal note, while I live in the Boston area, my family is originally from North Adams and I still visit there often. Um, I wanted to uh, suggest that the goals need to acknowledge regional equity. Uh, there's only one mode of transportation to Northwest Massachusetts and that's auto. There is no inner city mass transit beyond Westminster that I'm aware of. And uh, I think it's awkwardly phrased, but somebody else said it that, you know, the goal is to increase mobility um, the target population is not just those who are transit dependent, but those who prefer mass transit, such as rail, because it is safer and easier, and you can work while on the train, and as well as being much better for the environment uh, than autos, even if it's diesel. We can't get too hung up on electrification, even though we want it uh, throughout our system and, and are sadly lacking it mostly. Uh, I would also like to second the interstate rail connections that were raised, and I would expect that the, that the study uh, demand modeling will include rail trips north and south uh, in, the, in the valley using uh, Amtrak and the Valley Flyer. Uh, and in the long term, I would also, uh, I agree with all those who said we need to ex consider extensions west beyond North Adams to uh, Albany. Thank you. Thank you, Clint. So next question is from Andrew Smith says, hi, I am a selectman from the town of Orange. As you all know, Orange is located in central Massachusetts, so it is not necessarily Western Massachusetts or Eastern Massachusetts. Many times the people here feel somewhat forgotten. I guess my major hope is that the town of Orange will be a passenger rail stop here. Thank you, Andrew, for that comment. Anna, did you wanna chime in? I see you came on. Yes, um, you know, the legislation that uh, sponsored this study is mentioned specific cities, I believe North Adams and Greenfield but the study will assess all other stops that should be made in order to achieve the, the results and the impacts that the, um, that the, that's the intent of the legislation and the study. So Orange is in the running and it'll be part of the evaluation process. Great. Thank you, Anna, and thanks for the question. Uh, just a reminder that you can raise your hand um, in, on the bottom of the screen if you'd like to leave a verbal comment. Um, we'll keep trying to get through as many comments and questions as we can in the next 10 minutes. So the next question that we have comes from Sean Meyer and says, as part of the market and transportation analysis, will potential climate migration trends be factored in? Put another way, with rising sea levels, many experts are suggesting that individuals, homeowners and businesses located on the coast in subject to chronic flooding will need to move inland. How might the analysis best estimate what that might translate into as far as population changes here in Western Mass and possible usage or ridership of this new rail line. Um, Paul or Anna, uh, do either of you want to jump in for this one? Well, I was wondering if Andreas might like to take that. Maybe that was sandbagging him. <laughs> <laughs> Andreas, let me see. Do I have to ask? I'm going to ask him to unmute. Let's see. Might be having some trouble. I think he should be good now. Andreas, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you, uh, I apologize, can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a great question. So 
As part of the market and transportation analysis, will potential climate migration trends be factored in? Uh, with rising sea levels, many experts are suggesting that individuals, homeowners, and businesses um, located in areas subject to chronic flooding will need to move inland. How might the analysis best estimate what that might translate into as far as population changes here in Western Mass and possible usage and ridership of the new rail line? Well, that, that's a pretty substantial question there. Um, and you know, we are going to be looking at population trends in the region. Um, and we're working very closely uh, with Donahue Institute, uh, which does a lot of the uh, uh, examination of trends, uh, population trends in, in the state. Um, and I think there are, you know, we, we to some degree, I think we're going to have to rely on, you know, data and models that existing models have been developed for, um, you know, population growth and, and population shifts. So that's something we'll, we'll have to take a look at. And uh, we'll um, certainly be circling back with you all um, on the, uh, as the, uh, the uh, market analysis proceeds. Paul, did you want to add something there? Yeah, I just thanks, Erica. I just wanted to, I think Andreas hits on it, that I think that those trends, um, there's a certain responsibility that this study has to be done within the context of other transportation planning in the state. You know, part of uh, part of the decision that MassDOT and, and, and the state agency and the state as a whole has to make is, you know, how this is prioritized within other needs. Um, and so if and so there's a certain um, similarity that has to be there and how things are forecasted. But I do think that you are, you know, like to the, to the work that Andreas is gonna help support us on, it's not only, you know, potentially um, climate change in the future that's pushing people out of the Boston metro area and the coastal areas, it's also the cost of housing and things like that. So right. I think that, you know, there'll be a few different things we can test and see. Um, uh, and what we will make sure is that um, that we can communicate that clearly with the working group and with the public so people understand what goes into it and how we decided um, how, how we decided on our approach. Great. Thanks, Paul. So our next question uh, from Bob Armstrong uh, to comment says, I would encourage you to consider an additional goal to be reducing automotive congestion in Boston, which might mean expanding outlying parking such as at Alewife or further west so that driving right into the city is avoided. Um, thank you, Bob, for, for that comment. Um, so then we'll keep moving here. Um, and again, if you'd like to raise your hand, uh, that's an option as well in the last few minutes here. Um, so this is a question from Laura Kay um, that says, I hope that part of this effort will be educating the public about the benefits of rail travel for them well in advance of when the extended line will be available. Most people have little interest in switching from private automobile transportation to public transportation except when there isn't an, uh, any other choice. Will you start on an education component? And um, Paul or Anna, would you like to chime in? Because I, I do think this is gonna be, this is certainly gonna be a part of um, our study. Yeah, I'd like to, to start anyway. Um, obviously the part of the public involvement uh, process, which is substantial, will include a lot of material that will be educational for people about rail service that uh, may not, for people that may not be familiar with it. And we certainly intend to have our outreach be as effective doing that as possible. But I would also, you know, looking at the life cycle of it, putting in a rail service, what we're doing now is looking at what the best alternatives are. And then the effort begins to assemble the funding and the plan, you know, select the alternatives, refine the alternatives, um, find funding to implement and move forward. And that is a process that involves building constituencies in, in many um, at many levels. Uh, my previous experience working for State of Connecticut, we initiated two types of services, bus rapid transit and intercity rail, in which we had to educate the public about what was in it for them. But you have to you have to get a little you so you do that as at the planning level at the stage at the level we're talking about now when you move into a more detailed alternatives you have more to talk about and more that you can explain in a more uh, concrete level and eventually you get into an actual project where your job is to sell the people that you originally estimated in your ridership you know would be on the train so it's a it builds with what we're doing now and, and at every stage of the project. You build with more uh, and more detailed types of information. So, Paul or Erica, you, do you want to add? 
I see Paul coming off. I uh, just just to say nothing for me. Thank you. Great. Um, I see we have another hand up from Louise uh, Hetzler, so I will unmute. Hi there. Um, I've been a lifelong train buff, if you want to call it. I can remember at age three, traveling with my mother with a Pullman sleeper in the wall. And I've written many songs about trains. I'd like to offer them to this group as a way to educate children and adults about the, the joys of train travel. And I agree with everything people have been saying about how uh, we need it and we need to work on climate change now and electrification shouldn't be an end goal, but a starting goal uh, so that we do not dump any more of fossil fuels into the air so that we leave a clean planet for our children and grandchildren. So I would like to, if I, any way I can help uh, by education, I'm a music educator and I have a nonfiction a singer songwriter and many, many train songs, many of which were written while riding the train. And I'd like to offer them to the group for their use, for our use to educate the public about the joy of train travel. So thank you for all you're doing. Thank you, that's a very generous offer. Um, so we just have time for two more questions. And so um, I'll go ahead and uh, read off one more that we have here um, from Carol. Um, this says, I'd also like to make sure the idea of increased tourism is not overlooked for consideration. Our interest in North Adams was very much informed by the idea of the cultural corridor described in North Adams's vision 2030. Perhaps this falls under economic development, but I think it's way uh, to capitalize on increased interest in the area. It's a pleasure to hear of all these very important concerns and perspectives. Um, thank you, Carol, for, for that feedback and for being here. And then um, I'll read one final comment and then I'll pass it back over to uh, Michaela for a wrap up. So this is from Steve Hayes and says, just want to add support to discussion of out-of-state interests. Many of us in Brattleboro and Wyndham County, Vermont, would be thrilled to see any and all of these build-out proposals so close to or even possibly interconnecting with the route serving our community. Uh, thank you, Steve, for, for that comment. And uh, with that, I'll hand it back over to Michaela. Great. Thank you, Erica. And thank you, everyone, for your comments and questions. Um, so uh, with that, uh, thank you all again like I said, for being here today and for your participation. I encourage you to visit the study website to share any additional comments or questions using our comment form or to receive updates on the study uh, if you haven't already signed up for study updates. So the materials for this meeting, including the video recording, will be made available on the study website. And with that, uh, that concludes today's meeting. Thank you all for joining us. Have a great rest of your day, and we look forward to reconvening in the new year. Thanks so much, Michaela and everybody. Thank you all.